Welcome, everyone, and um, thanks to our sponsors, the uh, Socialist Project of the Center for Social Justice, as well as in particular Tanner Mirlees, who, as you've probably surmised if you've been on the call already, have uh, has spent a huge amount of time and energy putting this all together on the digital end. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, this marks the last launch of a register volume um, edited by Leo Panitch, um, a beacon of the international socialist left, as we all know, who has been utterly inseparable from the register and its tremendous success as its editor for the past 35 years. I'd like to begin today by reading a passage from his introduction to the second edition of his book, uh, Renewing Socialism. Um, he writes, we should at least try not to mix up our mortality with the issue of the realization of socialism. Marx's underestimation of the longevity of capitalism is but the first of many mistakes that the that rest on this understandable but unfortunate error. Many of the people on the left who feel despondent today and take seriously the talk about the death of socialism are only acknowledging that their death is likely to come before socialism does. But socialism need not come in our lifetimes for us to be politically relevant as socialists. The point of socialist politics is about ordinary people developing themselves through the process of engaging in political life. The first question a socialist should ask is whether existing political institutions provide a framework for doing that rather than repressing it. So long as we can muster the strategic creativity and imagination to develop alternative political institutions that will in fact be developmental, we are contributing to making socialism possible. A good many activists as well as intellectuals have come to this conclusion since the turn of the century. This is one small, if encouraging sign that an era of socialist renewal may be on the horizon. Over the past 35 years and more, that's the end of the quote, um, over the past 35 years and more, the register has been precisely such an institution. And this also means that while Leo may have left us, the crucial ongoing role of the register as a unique space for the international left remains. For those of us who worked with, on the register with Leo over the years, know all too well how much it meant to him from the countless hours spent working with authors to edit and develop essays to working with the editorial collective to think of themes and topics for future volumes, to waking up in the middle of the night, as he always did each year, with a new idea for the order in which the essay should appear in the volume. And the register was immediately on his mind after his cancer diagnosis, as he laid in his hospital bed and sent us an email to arrange things for the UK launch in December, which would sadly be the last public event at which Leo ever spoke, intervening during the Q&A to remind people about this event today. It was in the pages of the register that Leo's supervisor, Ralph Miliband, developed his pioneering theory of the state that is so foundational to the work so many of us are still carrying on today. And it was in the same pages that Leo and his close friend and co-writer, Sam Gindin, who's going to speak in a moment, developed the groundbreaking theory of the American empire that remains crucial to understanding contemporary world order. It was also in the register that Leo articulated his sharp critique of social democracy, working as Ralph did, to create a space for imagining a new socialist politics beyond social democracy and beyond Leninism, capable of representing and organizing working classes to wage a struggle on the terrain of the state as well as in the streets. Over the years, the register has held open this political space in an utterly non-sectarian and non-dogmatic way, putting in dialogue a wide range of the rich socialist intellectual traditions that are our greatest legacy as we seek to understand our world a legacy to which Leo made the significant and enduring contributions that were his gifts to the world and to all of us. In the first of the two video clips we're going to show today, in a moment here, Leo makes this case powerfully and passionately in a situation in which he relished, a public debate. Hopefully these clips will serve to bring Leo's spirit to our launch today. I will then hand things over to Sam Gindin, who will make a few remarks before proceeding to Greg and our panelists to launch the 2021 register, full of important and insightful essays in its own right. We will then wrap things up with one final uh, brief video clip of Leo. It is true that Lenin looked with admiration on the German post office, but he did not look with admiration on German central planning with its direction of labor, its uh, uh, conscription of trade unions and labor, et cetera. 
If you want to understand how that evolved in the Soviet Union, and it was not something that was a model that they imposed, you have to understand it in the context of the Civil War, the invasion of the Soviet Union by the forces that were victorious in World War I, and it was an unfortunate response to that Civil War, and I think as Isaac Deutscher pointed out, the great historian of Stalin, the journalist for The Economist here in Britain, what happened during the course of the war was that the anarcho-syndicalists turned out more popular than the Bolsheviks uh, when you had competing parties. But did so parties were done away with because it was never thought by socialists that once workers had been run to socialism, they might no longer support it. And they responded disastrously, disastrously, by closing off freedom of expression, competing parties, etc., were criticized immediately for this, most famously by Rosa Luxemburg. Why, this is why she's a hero of the democratic socialist left. Not only do you not have liberty when you don't have competing parties, freedom of association, what especially matters in a socialist society is workers develop ordinary people, developing the capacities to govern. And you can't do that where you have bureaucracy closing that off. So, have so you had yes, a the crack existed in Soviet socialism. It was resolved by 1924. You're quoting from L Leonard Cohn. He's thinking of this. There is a crack in everything. Let's ring the bells that still can ring. But he thinks, and I think, there was also a crack in social democracy. Let me just finish with this. What Eagleton says, it is the failure of the present in terms of, in terms of redeeming our possibilities. This is what redeems the socialist vision and the attempt by us socialists, as democratic socialists, to find a way for that not to happen again. Uh, and it is, as opposed to what uh, we just heard, the appalling failure, the appalling failure of neoliberal global capitalism to realize most people's potential. As we see in the way the gloss is off of it everywhere. The tragedy, of course, is that the failure of Soviet socialism, much more importantly, the way in which social democracy, the Third Way, Blairism, all the European social democratic parties embrace neoliberal globalization, leaves them now bereft in terms of speaking to their own constituency. The next clip we're going to show is one of my favorites, uh, filmed in London in 2019, amidst the excitement and promise of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party, and more importantly for Leo, the energy and organizing around it by the new generation of activists and momentum. It was filmed as Leo and former Register co-editor Colin Lees exited the World Transformed Conference put on by these activists alongside the Labour Party Conference. Leo found this incredibly exciting to attend each year and always came back excited and energized. Leo, what do you think of the economy at the moment? Oh, the economy is hardly the main problem right now. It's the, may I use the word, fucking politics that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, we got Boris Johnson yeah. who, uh, using public money, which should go to social care, spending it on his girlfriends. Yeah, that's right. And much worse, we have, you know, the possibility of a xenophobic uh, political rupture. Uh, led from the right with tragically a lot of working class people voting for it. And this is very, very scary. N not unique to Britain by any means, no, it's but global, very scary. We've got Bolsonaro, we've got Trump, Modi. A absolutely. We've got all sorts. Of like absolutely. An and we have an election coming in Canada where the same dangers are around. I mean, what we've got here is we've got a guy who's basically a blogger before, Dominic Cummings. Do you know this fellow? Yes. So right now, he has the entire British state apparatus in his hands. In his hands. <laughs> what do you think? That, that's scary though, that's isn't it? That's very scary. It's very scary. But the young people that are here, both uh, as delegates with Young Labour and uh, as CLP delegates and at the the World Transformed Conference are a shot in the arm. Let me tell you, whatever happens with Corbyn, this socialist upsurge in Britain is not going away. And that is the hopeful side of, of where things are at the moment. I've seen them. We have a plethora of PhD psychogeographers 
thinking about social policy? Oh, that's nothing. We have taxi drivers who are socialists <laughs> and who understand things a lot better than most PhDs. Got to see you. So long. Fight the power. So uh, with that, we're now going to hand things over to Leo's uh, longtime friend and co-writer and some of his most important work, Sam Gindin. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I've been avoiding watching clips of Leo, but it is wonderful to start seeing them again. Standing outside a conference with a group of devotees, a famous political scientist brags that there's only two people in the world he's afraid of, his mother and Leo Panitch. To anyone who knows Leo, this revelation elicits knowing smiles and an affirmative nodding of heads. But it also poses a question. Those with an authoritative and intimidating presence tend to bring a distancing from others. How then did so many nevertheless come to feel so close to Leo? The almost universal answer in the hundreds of emails sent in response to Leo's passing spoke to the vital social dimension that came with Leo's charisma. A genuine interest in others, a generosity in terms of time, an eagerness to schmooze, the quiet supportive hand on a student's shoulder that followed a crushing critique of an assigned paper. It was also impossible to ignore Leo's down to earth energy and enthusiasm. Whether he was speaking on Corbin or Sarisa, wolfing down a Polish sausage with sauerkraut at a Jays game, or lamenting his inability to play the sax, never mind play it like Sonny Rollins. All this came together in his passion as a teacher and public intellectual. His undergrad lectures opened up thousands of eyes to a different way of seeing the world. His grad seminars inspired new generations of young intellectuals to ruthlessly rethink everything. As a commentator on current events at home and internationally, Leo was stunningly comfor comfortable in launching on call into a clear explanation or an argumentative diatribe. In the middle of a phone conversation, he'd suddenly interrupt to say to me, shit, it's five minutes to my interview at four. We can only talk for two more minutes. Then I have to find out what it's about so I can get my head around it. In those talks and interviews, Leo powerfully pressed to his very last days for an alternative common sense. Ever provocative, he challenged listeners to think deeper and more ambitiously about the kind of society they wanted. Yet the most effective political messenger still needs a quality message, and that was Leo's forte. A few examples. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels spoke eloquently and prophetically of capitalism's ten tendency to nestle everywhere. But absent the theory of the state, they generally ignored the counter possibility of states putting roadblocks in capitalism's march to internationalization. It was this counter possibility that characterized the long first half of the 20th century, when capitalism experienced two horrific world wars and a devastating depression that severely interrupted global economic connections. Far from being inevitable, a seamless global capitalism actually seemed impossible. Globalization clearly had to be made, but for many actors across the political spectrum, this meant leaving corporations and markets to do their thing while states retreated from prominence. Leo, in contrast, insisted that rather than being victims of globalization, states, with the US playing a special role, were globalization's indispensable authors. With globalization, states became internationalized in the sense of taking a prime responsibility for establishing the conditions for global accumulation within their own borders. States consequently became more important than ever. Similarly, at the ideological level, Leo emphasized that the legitimation of globalization wasn't carried out through international institutions but by way of each nation state promising that its country will be a winner under globalization and bring national prosperity. Nationalist ideology was therefore a constituent part of globalization, not in opposition to it. And as the popular promises of globalization failed, 
the question turned to whether the consequent frustrations would be mobilized by the left or the right. More generally, the state was at the core of reproducing capitalism, and for socialists, the social force for taking on the state began with workers. But for Leo, there was no romanticization of the working class. Workers were limited by their dependence on employers. They were fragmented by competition, wage differentials, and racial and ethnic divisions. And the realities of survival pressured them towards short-termism and local self-interest. This posed the most fundamental question of all. Could working classes so deformed by capitalism really take on the most momentous of tasks, transforming the world? Were they likely to even conceive of taking on such a mission? Concrete hopes, as opposed to daydreams, are inseparable from what we think is possible. And possibility is itself contingent on confidence in structures that might credibly win our goals. This is where the role of a mass socialist party comes in. The immediate task of such a party isn't how to carry out a still distant revolution. Rather, it's to support the transformation of auto atomized and demoralized workers into a confident social force. One with its own vision and the capacities to analyze and understand, debate constructively, strategize and organize, bridge the immediate and the long-term. As for the eventual practice of socialist governance, the strategic dilemma so graphically posed in the case of Syriza was the triple quandary of a newly elected socialist party. How to govern in a way that satisfies popular needs in what is still a capitalist economy? How to simultaneously keep building the base essential to expanding future options, including popular pressure on the very state the party was now formally leading? And alongside this, how to transform the inherited capitalist state which is, with its historically developed capacities specific to administering a capitalist economy into a socialist state with entirely new capacities supportive of both planning and the deepest democratic participation. In all these challenges, the socialist register was for Leo ground zero. The register institutionalized a Marxist community that is politically engaged, non-sectarian, and accessible in the sense of being committed to communicating, not trying to impress. The re register's one rigid insistence was and remains that only the best scholarship and most sober analysis could contribute to social transformation. Leo was a sober optimist and an anti-utopian utopian. Doubt seeped in with the failure of his and my generation to take advantage of new openings and find a new politics. But there really was no option other than to live our lives as fully as we could and act as if socialism was possible. And because socialism, socialism was unlikely to emerge in our lifetime, as Steve referred to that quote by Leo, Leo was amongst those who accepted that contributing to something that might only be realized beyond our own lifespans was the closest we could come to immortality. In grieving Leo, we can look for solace in the rich and happy life he led, the body of ideas and legacy he left, and how much better we all were in so many ways for having crossed paths with him. Leo was a gift. Yet there's no erasing the deep sadness that will remain as we try to move on with our lives and look to advance the work that defined Leo's political life. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. That was wonderful. Um, now we're gonna move on with the um, launch of the 2021 volume and the discussions of uh, the different essays from Brian Palmer, Joan Sangster, Pat and Hugh Armstrong, Tanner Mirlees, uh, Derek Renishin, um, and then we'll turn it over to Greg. So uh, Greg, it's all yours. Um, it's uh, incredibly difficult to uh, do this year's hosting of the uh, New Socialist Register, uh, the launch this year, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the absence of Leo, even as we 
had him speak here for a few moments. It seemed impossible to do it without having his presence, in, at least in that sense. Um, he really loved doing these events. Uh, it was a chance to, uh, the events in New York and in and, and London that we did, and particularly in, in Toronto, uh, where it was a chance to share a meal, have a drink with friends, debate politics, uh, get a respite from the winter's cold, the blast of cold that we always have in January or February. Uh, it's, it's, and I think that's partly why it just, I think it was about five days, six days before he passed that he insisted that we go ahead with the launch, whatever may happen to him. And thus uh, we're doing this uh, today, uh, as difficult as it is uh, without his presence. I have known Leo for a very long time. Uh, uh, in a sense, uh, as an undergraduate at, at, in Winnipeg at the University of Manitoba, I started knowing Leo before I'd actually met, met him. Uh, we had shared many of the same friends, some of the same professors, some of the same political groups, campaigns. Uh, I was just there 15 years later, but it already felt that I was kind of becoming a friend of his before I'd even met. Um, moving to Ottawa to study with him before he left and then picking up again as I joined him as a colleague at, uh, at York University in Toronto. Uh, it was kind of been an, a continual dialogue. And as soon as I moved into Toronto, it was a dialogue that was in Ottawa, it was always with Donald and Leo. Uh, since I moved to uh, 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 Toronto, it was also with Sam all the time, a kind of continual dialogue about everyday events, uh, almost everything under the sun we were debating. Uh, particularly looking at it from the perspective of union and socialist strategies. Uh, it's been an unforgettable journey of debate, teaching, guiding students, writing pamphlets, speaking on panels together, uh, editing and so forth. Uh, it's just been incredible. Like uh, Sam and Steve, as they, as they spoke, uh, I miss Leo so much. So do many others here. Yeah. Leo's... Uh, Writing, public speaking, political activism, always traversed um, the socialist register. Of course, Ralph was his supervisor. His first essay in 1979 on socialists and the Labour Party, uh, followed by uh, his essay debating with Ellen Wood on liberal democracy, liberal democracy and socialist democracy in 1981. Uh, they followed uh, much of the work that he did under Ralph on incomes policies and the crisis of the, of the Labour Party as the post-war social, social order was falling apart. He followed that with a series of essays on the economic crisis and the impasse of social democracy through the 1980s. With his joining Ralph as co-editor of the Register in 1985, it was almost a continual alteration between a series of essays on the crisis of representation of working class politics and the left, uh, followed by specific uh, uh, Essays on this on the essays on the specific features of neoliberal globalization as it was as it was emerging in the 1990s and as it was continued to uh, uh, spread across the globe under U.S. literature leadership. Uh, each volume of the register since uh, Leo was editing uh, reads much as as much as anything as the recent history of of the left and the socialist movement. Uh, the titles ring this the impasse of social democracy, the retreat of intellectuals, coming to terms with nature, the crisis this time, rethinking democracy, and so on. Uh, they capture much of what we were struggling with intellectually and politically. When I joined uh, uh, Leo as co-editor with Vivek Cheber in uh, 2010, uh, we had began a process of really thinking through in four or five year plans of, of what we were doing. From 2011 to 2015, uh, it was about the financial crisis inevitably and its aftermath and how it was registering itself in the class structures of the ruling and working classes and the corresponding strategies that were emerging from each of these, of, of these classes. From 2016 to 2019, it was on the rise of the new right, the challenges this was posing for the left what it meant for rethinking revolution, rethinking democracy, and a world turned upside down. We began a new set of, of, of volumes in 2020, intending to look at the current period from a number of different angles, intellectually, uh, theoretically and empirically, 
the premise of these volumes was that neoliberalism was longstanding uh, and still dominant, but discredited, uh, attempting, uh, but discredited into uh, in its current political social forms, but still attempting to build and extend uh, markets, protect pri private property, uh, and so forth. But it was doing so increasingly in distorted, dystopic, authoritarian, polarized, and ecologically unsustainable ways. And yet, at the same time, there was a left still struggling to regroup, build new political agencies, and effectively pose alternatives to neoliberalism and the immediate sense in capitalism in the longer term. An editorial dialectic, we decided to pose things, to pose things the way they are against the way they might be. Last year's volume and this year's volume, uh, last year's volume Beyond Market Dystopia, this year's volume on Beyond Digital Capitalism, carried the same subtitle, New Ways of Living to reinforce that dialectic that we wanted to establish in each of the volumes. The remit we gave ourselves and our contributors for this, from this year's preface, preface tried to capture that. Beyond Digital Capitalism was planned in, in uh, uh, Beyond Dig Digital Capitalism was planned long before the greatest health crisis by far in over a century exploded, quite literally on a global scale through the course of the first half of 2020. This crisis fully exposed for all to see the severe consequences of long-standing neoliberal state practices beholden to the blinkered competitive individualism of the proponents of pro-market ideology. And it drove them, however belatedly, confusedly, and temporarily, to undertake the types of massive social expenditures they had derided only months before. But the pandemic also posed a new challenge for socialists, including, including for us as the editors, as well as for the contributors to this volume, who we invited to analyze the nature of digital capitalism and its contradictions. Could we now do this in ways that also captured the significance of the pandemic and what it spoke to in terms of imagining struggling for and planning for new ways of living. I think uh, uh, we accomplished a lot of this, as difficult as that remit was. Remit was. Um, it is not possible to summarize even briefly the essays in the volumes, uh, in the volume, but to put it in the simplest matrix possible, there's a set of essays examining automation and digital capitalism historically through the changes of the modes of exploitation work and corporate organization, uh, importantly rejecting all the techno-determinist characteristics of, the, of, the, of, of, of uh, artificial intelligence and digital capitalism, uh, uh, particularly under the notion of a new interpretation machine as Larry Lohman calls it in his essay, on, in his incredible essay on artificial intelligence. There's a brace of essays looking at high-tech capital uh, surveillance and social media and the possibilities for alternative control, al alternative control and platforms for communication, transportation, work organization, a series of essays examining alternative ways of living through the prism of the pandemic and alternative ways of social planning and participatory and uh, of social provisioning and participatory planning. I think quite a remarkable series of essays. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to some of those uh, remarkable essays to the contributors, uh, beginning with Brian Palmer. I will introduce each in turn as we go along. Brian is professor of history uh, from Trent University in Peterborough in, in, in Ontario, uh, one of the great historians of working class and socialist history. Uh, Brian will speak to his essay, The Time of Our Lives, Reflection, Reflections on Work and Kem Capitalist Temporality. Brian. I, uh, I want to thank both uh, Greg and Sam for those uh, comments on Leo. I, I won't say a lot on Leo. I think uh, I'm very grateful for both of, for what both uh, uh, Greg and Sam said. Um, I want to just really confirm that aside from the sort of brilliance and range of Leo, um, the warmth and generosity that was there and his capacity to extend that in the midst of differences, intellectual and political. Um, he could be fierce and he could be feared, I'm sure. And as Sam started out, uh, there were many who were sort of both in awe, rightly, and uh, in fear of his capacities. But um, we argued over the years a great deal and, and uh, um, 
and often about politics, um, not so much about uh, the interpretations uh, that we put forward, but about practical and strategic matters on the left. Um, and what I found as, as I came to know Leo a little better in the last decade, I would say, was just what, how, what, an, you know, what, what an impressive uh, range he had and what a generous uh, um, spirit he had and what enthusiasm he had for all kinds of, of work. And I'll be forever grateful for him, to him for, um, in some senses, inviting me in to play uh, a, a writer's role in the, in the, in the register um, because uh, it allowed me a space to write as a Marxist and a socialist uh, and an historian in ways that increasingly I found the historical profession did not offer. Um, we were all Marxists back in the, in, the, in the 70s when working class history started. Very few of us remained standing the ground of revolutionary socialism. And, you know, Leo really did follow the Fred Jameson injunction to always historicize. And he appreciated historical writing greatly. And it was really, uh, it was the, the opportunity to write in that vein uh, that I've found very, uh, um, enthralling and in, in a sense emancipating over the last little while. And I, I, I do thank very much Leo uh, for that. The essay that I contributed to the current volume, um, I must confess, I, 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 I feel a bit the imposter uh, because I have very little to say really of, of much substance about uh, the gigafied economy, about digitalization, about the new uh, sort of platform technologies that are uh, so often associated with precarious labor in our times and that have sort of revamped uh, the sort of occupational structures, structures of modern capitalism. Um, but I am uh, very much, I think, in line with Larry Lohman's essential point in his article, and that in fact, uh, much that seems new uh, has in fact been experienced before. Um, much that seems uh, totally innovative and challenging and transformative uh, in, the, in these new technologies is in, a, in, in qualitative ways runs parallel to experiences that the working class have had with technologies and innovations in the past. Um, uh, and, you know, we see that very much in the contemporary time where COVID-19 has forced people into working from home. Uh, many gigafied workers have in fact been engaged in work relations that are very similar to the putting out system. Although the intensity of uh, the ca capacity of these uh, interpretive machines to uh, monitor and surveil, which so many of the authors, uh, including Joan, uh, look at uh, in the current register. Uh, is, is, of course, uh, qualitatively different. Um, so when Greg and, and Leo suggested that I might write something on time, they, in, in fact, alluded to uh, me kind of revisiting E.P. Thompson's famous article from 1967, Time, Work, Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism. Um, and the opportunity to relook at and rethink that essay uh, was refreshing. And what it brought to mind, of course, that I tried to convey in my article as, as someone interested in working class mobilizations in the past is the centrality, the centrality of the struggle over the working day, which of course Marx pointed out. Time, Marx said in a, in a, in a comment before the International Working Men's Association in 1865, is the room of human development. It's, it's, it's the space in which uh, humanity proceeds. Um, and he understood uh, the central importance of short of, of the struggle over the working day, uh, seeing that uh, and, and, and argued that the, 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 the crucial struggles of the working class were in order to uh, sort of uh, um, uh, challenge the serpent of their uh, uh, oppression was to uh, counterpose to the sort of postured and, and uh, um, uh, pompous bourgeois declarations of the inalienable rights of man, 
their own working class Magna Carta of uh, the limit, limits that needed to be placed on a working day. Um, but what Marx also uh, argued and understood was that every victory of the working class under capitalism around the issue of time and many other issues was of course very likely to be turned by capital to its own purposes. And the intensification of labor that followed every reduction in working time that, that, that uh, organized workers secured over the course of the 19th uh, and into the 20th century was generally combated by intensifications of labor, technological changes, new managerial strategies such as Taylorism, all of which meant that the time won by workers was always going to be clawed back. And Marx understood this so that the, the, the generalized problem he confronted was that with capitalism, it was the, the trajectory of all of capital's projects was to make all 24 hours of the day uh, time in which capital would in fact be uh, capable of exploiting labor, to make labor uh, subject to capital for not just uh, the working day, but the entire day. Um, and I think we see this uh, dramatically in uh, the new forms of work and the new ways of living that have been imposed upon workers uh, in the digital age. Um, the ways in which uh, workers are working from home, which is in some senses a return to the putting out system, are expected to work piecework as they had in, you know, under industrial capitalism to produce more and more minute uh, sections of knowledge and commodities that can then be marketed by uh, uh, um, entrepreneurs like associated with Amazon and, and other kinds of platforms. So really it struck me that that what was vital uh, to come to grips with in new ways of living differently was to begin to address the extent to which the struggle over the working day, which is still going to continue under new forms of capitalism. Actually, uh, there never has been a time when the, the, the old banner of the mainstream trade union movement, a fair day's work for a fair day's wage, needed to be replaced with, replaced with Marx's banner, the abolition of the wage system. Um, the struggle around time, which is going to be fundamental to all future struggles and, and the new ways of living uh, that the register is, is trying to address, is, is understandably going to have to, I think, begin to rethink what had been tried and true uh, uh, um, areas of struggle for much of working class uh, experience over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and indeed the struggle against capitalism uh, is going to be a struggle fundamentally about time and freeing time from the ever encroaching exploitative and oppressive capacities of capital. Um, and what was very interesting to me was the way in which uh, uh, situating Thompson's essay on time and work discipline uh, in the context of the 1960s, that was in some sense the high water mark of the struggle over time. It's not surprising that Thompson wrote about uh, time and work discipline at a moment when uh, it seemed that for the advanced capitalist economies and uh, particularly Fordist uh, workers in the Fordist sector organized and strong had in fact secured the eight hour day. So many workers around the world and even within advanced capitalism had not of course, but what, it, what happened was is that for almost 25 years that stasis around the working day uh, seemed to indicate that the forward march of labor had not just been halted but it had achieved so much. Um, what happened, of course, with the 1970s, a fiscal crisis of capitalism uh, and a re the recurring crises that, that, that unfolded, of which we're in one right now, uh, of which the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, is one expression, has basically moved the boundaries so that new struggles uh, around time have to, take a new, have to take a new form. And I think a, uh, a much more um, uh, decisively anti-capitalist, anti-wage anti-wage anti 
the wage system. To do that, however, requires rebuilding what has been lost over the course of the last 50 years, which is the obliteration, in my view, of the organized left. Um, that uh, is in, in conjunction with uh, sort of rebuilding and revitalizing uh, trade unions is and, and building bridges to uh, all manner of social movements and coalitions is the central task of our time. I think that will be the way and the only way uh, that truly new ways of living uh, can be advanced. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Brian, as provocative as always, <laughs> conveying much of your essay. Uh, I'm so pleased that uh, Joan Sangster is able to be uh, with us uh, uh, after recovering from some health problems. Uh, she's, Joan is professor of history at Trent University, uh, now retired, uh, and of course is one of Canada's most important and eminent feminist historians. Uh, Joan's essay in this year's volume is titled The Surveillance of Survey Service Labor, Conditions and Possibilities for, of resistance. Uh, no doubt just the title itself conveys the importance of her, of her writing on this topic. Joan? Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm really honored not only to be part of this panel, but also to be in this year's issue of the Socialist Register, but obviously so saddened that we're here remembering Leo and paying tribute to him rather than sitting on a panel and engaging with him. The loss of Leo cuts so very deep, obviously, for his family and close friends, but also for scholarly life more generally, for socialist networks around the world, um, and for the, the political community that he created and sustained with his incredible energy and intellect, his warmth, his, his passionate commitment to a better world. I didn't, I don't have the long time close connection to Leo that some other people on the panel do, but my more recent welcome into the circle of Leo and Melanie's friends and comrades gave me a glimpse of what Brian calls in his Canadian Dimension piece, uh, Leo's polymath kind of re renaissance, expansive understanding of the socialist project and his many enthusiasms from jazz to food, to hockey, to politics. It also gave me a glimpse of his ability to inspire others. And it provided me with a warm welcome to a socialist community of mutual regard, of respect, um, of discussion. Being a historian or a Marxist historian, even a historian interested in Marxism in Canada is being part of a very tiny group. Uh, Brian made some reference to this. So I was really thankful for the uh, increasing intellectual connection to left political economists, uh, to feminists and socialists who had such a very different view of the world. Leo was always encouraging about my writing, um, if not sometimes daunting in discussion. Um, and in fact, uh, I was pleased that when I was working on fur workers, I found some of the records of his father's membership in the union, a picture of his father on the, on the uh, union executive in Winnipeg. Leo had incredible respect for the craft of historical writing. When uh, Sam said in his Canadian Dimension interview that he really valued the historical and historical materialism, I thought that comment was absolutely right on. I think Leo and also Greg drew me into discussions uh, of the register, though not just hoping for a historical point of view, but his also for a socialist feminist point of view, which Leo wanted to hear. I don't actually know how he managed all his connections in so many countries with so many people, but I do recall one trip to Chicago with him and Brian for a platypus conference or platypi conference, I don't know the exact term, um, that to me was very revealing. Um, the platypi are overwhelmingly young people. Um, I missed most of the conference, but I went to the final summing up panel where Leo spoke. He had infinite patience and enthusiasm for the crowd long after I was tired of the revolution and just wanted to go and eat something. 
he engaged with them he engaged with them like as comrades he didn't lecture to them he differed and debated with them but he listened to them he pushed them to think about new things and when that uh, conference and discussion was finally over he was ready to seek out new conversation um, discussion uh, music and food so when i think about honoring leo i really think not only about his political and intellectual contributions but that sense of socialist comradeship that he uh, cultivated so well. When we talked um, as a group about this issue of the register, I didn't imagine that my work was really related to what, to what we were going to talk about, to AI or technology or the digital world. But this was actually not true because technology is absolutely central to labor history and to changing modes of surveillance of, of human labor. So what I did in my piece was use research on service labor, particularly feminized service work, to question the changing nature of modes of surveillance and control in relation to more recent technology, although also taking a long historical view. Uh, the essays by Palmer and uh, Larry Lohman, I think, helped to frame my case studies. Um, and the essay actually in this register on the massification of fashion is a very nice compliment to mine because while he talks about the, um, the um, just-in-time production, I'm talking about just-in-time selling in terms of retail work. I think like a number of people uh, writing in the register, part of what I wanted to do was look at or to question and challenge a kind of techno-determinism uh, in which digital technologies that are truly transforming work and consumption and living are seen as something that there is very little means of resistance to, no contradictions, simply a kind of impending cyber dystopianism in the world of work. If I was guided by overall assumptions in terms of what I was writing, I think there were a couple of things. Uh, one was that we should take a feminist and materialist approach to labor. We need an eye for the asymmetrical relations of power relations of gender and race on the one hand, but also a materialist concern with the kernel of human relations at the very heart of capitalism, which is lived exploitation. So surveillance reflects the determining logic of accumulation, uh, but these relations are always lived out through cultural and ideological processes that are uh, that have gender and race inequalities built into them. And secondly, if, if um, surveillance is tethered to the logic of accumulation, it also very much shapes the nature of alienation that workers experience. Um, often writers use examples from uh, produ the production of commodities to talk about alienation, but service labor also produces a commodity, even though it's consumed very differently often involving the bodies and emotions of, of service workers. So alienation will, their alienation will differ um, according to, the, to its nature and service labor. So in the article, there's three sections. I just wanna sort of briefly talk about what I, I was trying to get at. One section is historical, um, takes a historical perspective. And um, then the last two look at flight attendant labor and retail labor, both of which are face-to-face -face service labor, both of which involve emotional and aesthetic labor, but they have very different outcomes in terms of surveillance. And I think somewhat echoing Brian, um, I think it's very useful to take a long historical view and look at the writings from Marx to that on Taylorism to the more recent feminist uh, work that looks at the gendered and racialized nature of service labor to look at changing but unchanging forms of surveillance over time. This warns us against a technological determinism and shows that technological advances do not always produce automatically more intensive surveillance. Um, there's certainly some writing uh, that assumes that uh, there's a lockstep a movement of uh, surveillance with technology, that there is um, a radical shift in all occupations to more computerized um, technologies. 
And that at, at a certain point in the 80s and 90s, there was a shift from a sort of top-down Taylorism to the uh, a more Foucauldian kind of uh, self-monitoring of workers. But taking the long historical view has some benefit. I think because ultimately one could say that these are all Taylorist in orientation. In other words, squeezing labor and its costs through the intensification of measuring, monitoring, surveillance is what it is at the very heart of a lot of this. And taking a long historical view has a benefit when you look at flight attendant work and retail work as well. Um, if you think about flight attendant work actually in the 50s, 60s and 70s, it couldn't be a more surveyed, monitored, regulated uh, kind of labor, partly because it was femini feminized and, and uh, women workers were sexualized. Um, but what is striking, I think, with flight attendant work is not only the changes, but the continuities, the way in which there's an assemblage of different kinds of surveillance used in the workplace. And yet resistance has always been a strong theme in terms of flight attendant work. They have strong activist and union traditions and that along with the nature of the work process, their claim on skills has given them the ability to often resist um, surveillance. Now, if you read the piece, it will feel like it comes from another era and it does. It comes from a pre-pandemic era I actually wrote it before the pandemic, um, which of course has changed everything with flight attendant work. It's decimated it. Um, and that devastation, I think, opens up a whole other set of questions. Uh, retail workers, I contrast them to flight attendant workers, are not so fortunate to have these kind of union traditions and roots. It's a far more variegated kind of service labor, but again, looking at it, in terms of a long historical view, you see not only changes, but some continuities and an assemblage of different kinds of surveillance, including the more recent intensification of uh, surveillance, uh, digital technologies and surveillance as work has become also more precarious, more part-time and so on since the 1980s. There's often the use of biometric fingerprinting, information gathering, and a function creep in which certain kinds of technologies were used to quote, solve one problem with retail workers. And then they became a boon to management because they discovered they could survey and control all kinds of other things to do with work. But technology I try to show is not fallible, it's not neutral. And there are some modes of resistance used often though in contrast to union ones more um, informal, more subversion, and so on. So ultimately, what does this feminist, materialist, and historical uh, view offer in terms of looking at technology, surveillance, and service labor? Well, hopefully all the correct answers, uh, but also some new questions. And one thing I didn't talk about much in the paper, and I think we need to talk about more, is the relationship between social reproduction and surveillance. Um, we know that um, obviously both paid care and unpaid familial care are shouldered uh, by women disproportionately. We know that women patching together online work and then trying at the same time to do childcare are under increasing stress. Uh, we know the evisceration of the welfare state has led to women doing more care for uh, family members and yet being surveyed by the state even more to see if they're doing it properly. And there are many other examples of ways in which I think we need to think about that connection between social reproduction and surveillance. I think any surveillance, any look at surveillance at work uh, needs a lot more than a call for worker privacy, which some legal scholars call for, or a dystopian determinist focus on the runaway project of technologies. It requires organizing strategies, assessing the multiple forms of resistance that workers used to try and establish some dignity in their working lives. And most important, it requires a broader critique of the capitalist and neoliberal ideologies legitimating surveillance and the gender and race hierarchies sustaining it. We should never avert our eyes from its most elemental raison d'etre. Surveillance lies at the heart of capitalist accumulation and the hierarchical power relations inherent in contract deployment.
employment. That conclusion, I think, owes a debt to Leo's intellectual influence on my thinking, and I hope it also reflects a political sensibility that he too would have appreciated. Thank you, Joan, for that incredible essay and presentation. That was really, really great. Uh, I'm going to turn now to you, Armstrong and Pat Armstrong. Uh, uh, you was professor of social work at Carleton University in Ottawa. Pat is professor of sociology at York University in Toronto. They are two of the world's most important commentators on the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of times over the last 10 months I've written their names when asked in, into my emails uh, when asked, uh, how do I understand the pandemic and what's going on in long-term care and what's happening to seniors in the country? And I said, well, you have to read Pat and you on long-term care and so on and so forth. I've done it hundreds of times. I'm glad to turn it over to Pat and you uh, with their essay in this volume titled, Start Early, Stay Late, Planning for Care in Old Age. Pat and you. Thank you, Greg. One of the most remarkable things about the hundreds of tributes written by about Leo is their consistency, as we just heard, even though they have been written by people who encountered him in different ways at different times and in different places as a colleague, a teacher, a writer, an activist, a theorist grounded in today and a friend. Larger than life, a towering Marxist intellect, an amazing presence, supportive of others, consistent at the core of his intellectual thinking, even as it further developed, and committed to living his socialism while fostering community. He did this, as we've heard again and again tonight, not only through sharing ideas and his impressive intellectual work, but also through sharing his food, his drink, and his laugh. The attendance and presentations at the 2016 conference held to honor his retirement graphically illustrated the breadth and depth of his social and intellectual influence and the extraordinary respect such a range of people have for Leo as a person, a public intellectual and a friend. He was a realist with imagination and with a love of both life and others. We have the exceptional privilege of knowing him and Melanie in all these ways. I can still hear Leo say terrific, often followed by an incisive critique. I can still hear the rigorous debates we had over dinner, perhaps less rigorous as the wine bottles emptied. Our last conversation was from his hospital bed as he described in detail what he saw as the rich experience of his working class roommates. He recounted how a nurse came into the room to announce Leo was a celebrity. Leo's response was to spark a conversation on the importance of universal health care that included everyone on equal terms. He never missed an opportunity to move us all forward. Let me add a few words on his moving us forward through his institution building and his editing. I first encountered Leo when he invited me to join uh, the Socialist Seminar Series that he established at Carleton in the mid 70s. We presented draft papers, several of which uh, under his excellent and generous le leadership made their way into his edited collection, The Canadian State in 1977. This book in turn became a vital inspiration for the establishment in the spring of 79 of Studies in Political Economy, a Socialist Review, which is happily still with us. Leo was central to its founding and over the years contributed a remarkable 11 es essays to it. He did not, however, limit himself to its intellectual work. The SPE executive was a socialist collective, and Leo took on the grunt responsibility for dealing with its printer. Some of you will remember when journals were just in hard copy. As we all know, Leo moved to York in 84 and quickly became a key leader in its politics department and more broadly in its university. He also switched his collaborative editing focus to the Socialist Register. We know the result. 
the current issue of this must read annual brings us together this evening. The register is invariably wide in scope while brilliantly coherent in theme. Pat and I have been privileged to benefit from the editorial wisdom that he, along with Colin Lees and then Greg Albo, have brought to our chapters in the 2010 volume and in the current one. When Leo asked us to write the chapter for the register on long-term residential care, we framed our piece around the forces of privatization. For us, privatization is the move away not only from public delivery and public payment, but also from a commitment to shared responsibility, democratic decision-making, and the notion of operating on a logic of service to all in equitable ways. And for us, technologies are about the way we do things around here. Our critiques of digital technologies grow out of our feminist understanding of care as a relationship, one that requires empathy, human contact, emotional connection, and a response to individuals based on acquired skills. The most common forms are, uh, the most common are information technologies that take four forms, data on resources, data on how work should be done, data on how employees should work for how long, at what speed, and data on the consequences or outcomes. What counts is what can be counted. And the purpose, as Braverman so clearly explained, is about reducing the costs and the time, mainly through control over the workers, as we've just heard from our two previous presentations. In this case, what is understood as de-skilling though, builds on the undervaluing of women's care work. In this field, long-term care is care for women, by women, many of whom are racialized and or newcomers. The various forms of privatization in long-term care have meant barely enough of everything. Barely enough pre-pandemic means not nearly enough during the pandemic with disastrous consequences for all those who live in, work in, and visit in long-term care. We argue that daring to dream about elder care, as Leo asked us to do, means building shared responsibility from birth and begins with three basic principles. First, and this is very much in keeping with the clip we heard from Leo at the very beginning, there is no same single perfect model, no single right way, and no single endpoint. Rather, we need to start by designing care through genuinely democratic, ongoing, accessible processes that take specific contexts and populations into account. Second, equitable participation means equitable conditions throughout life, beginning by providing the conditions that make having children a safe and supportive option. Three, we have to plan for and create supportive communities, ones that take various forms and that adapt to various needs, that desegregate housing and services and are based on universal design principles. In the spirit of the subtitle repeated for this year's register, New Ways of Living, and in the context of the principles that Pat has just listed, we wish to end on a positive note by arguing for the need to build a democratically designed and controlled long-term residential care system that one, recognizes that the conditions of work are the conditions of care, that two, recognizes that this is skilled work, that three, includes the entire range of services within the system, that four declares that we have a shared right to and responsibility for care, care that is delivered primarily by women, primarily to women. There is a long and winding road ahead of us all to overcome the class, gender, and racial inequalities, and to create intergenerational equity in elder care and elsewhere. 
That is why we titled our chapter, Start Early, Stay Late. Leo certainly started early, and we are all profoundly sorry that he did not get to stay late. Thank you. Thanks, Pat and you. Uh, wonderful. Uh, now, now everybody knows why I've been uh, uh, typing your names into uh, all the inquiries I'm getting about how to understand the, the long-term care crisis. Thank you very much for your essay and your comments uh, right now. I'm going to now invite uh, Tanner Mirlis uh, to speak. Tanner is a professor of communication and digital media at Ontario Tech U. He has a re recent outstanding book on, uh, on, on tech ed, uh, which is totally timely since we're all doing our teaching on Zoom, etc. And uh, it's a wonderful critique of uh, all the crazy claims about uh, the advantages of high tech and, 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 and teaching. Uh, Tanner's uh, essay in this year's volume, Socialists on Social Media Platforms, Communicating with, In, and Against Digital Capitalism. Tanner? Leo, um, Leo may be best known for his political economy of global capitalism and American empire, but I, I wanna take a moment to pay tribute to Leo for his many significant contributions to the cultural life of the community in downtown Toronto. So for the past six years, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Leo on the Socialist Projects Cultural Committee, along with many of Leo's dear friends and comrades, such as Carl Beveridge, Carol Conde, Scott Forsyth, David McElrath, Mike Constable, Khan, Sue, Nithya, Bob, Alina, and many more uh, who are here tonight. Um, and we all miss Leo very deeply and, and remember him so fondly. Um, motivated by Leo's enthusiasm and his incredible talent of building meaningful social bonds and inspiring folks to work on collective projects, um, our committee co-organized events like Film Social, which probed the social problems of capitalism through public screenings and discussions of popular films. Uh, everything from I, Daniel Blake to Sorry uh, to Bother You. Um, we organized sort of under Leo's kind of energy and direction art versus alt, which inspired artistic activists to challenge the far right. It was rising just in 2016. Um, we built Drawing the Left to Radical Creativity. And most recently over the past two years, we organized the Red Knight series um, with its socialist feminist cabaret and its general strike cabaret 1919. So Leo played an absolutely crucial and central role in all of these community cultural events. Um, and he was committed to this committee to the, to the very end. Uh, even from hospital, Leo was still attending the committee's meetings and encouraging us to continue building um, for the future. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the, the last event that Leo was part of, um, Voices Beyond Borders, a poetic and musical tribute to Paul Robson in celebration of Black History Month, um, indeed went forward and, and is happening in two weeks. And, and I'm sure Leo would be happy if, if people joined that as well. And the links um, in, in the forum there. So in, in recognition of Leo's tireless commitment to the Socialist Projects Cultural Committee, um, we all sort of referred to sort of Leo with a smile and wink as imp impresario, you know, Panich, you know, just to again, recognize the labor of love he put into to these events. Um, and I think that Leo found that quite humorous. So on behalf of the Cultural Committee, I want to express our sincere gratitude to Leo for the many happy memories we shared and the many cultural events that we organized. Um, even though Leo always told me he'd never go on Facebook, um, I, I found it interesting that Leo and, and of course Greg and Steve offered such immensely helpful guidance, a crucial guidance on my SRSA, uh, socialist on social media platforms, communicating with and against uh, global capitalism or digital capitalism, which which I'll now just share a brief preview of. So um, in, in the 1932 essay the, essay, the Radio is an Apparatus of Communication, Bertolt Brecht made a positive suggestion to transform radio into a dialogical medium for many to many communications. Quote, radio is one-sided when it should be two, said Brecht, and the radio would be the finest possible communication apparatus in public life if it knew how to receive as well as how to transmit, how to let the listener speak as well uh, to hear, and thereby bring many into a relationship with many others instead of isolating them." End quote. Breck saw the state as the only entity capable of remaking radio in this way, but because radio's proper application, said Breck, might make it a revolutionary medium, 
Brett concluded that the bourgeois state would have no interest, quote, in sponsoring such exercises. There is some truth to that, of course. Whether built as a commercial venture or as a national public broadcaster, the media institutions of the 20th century were for the most part designed as a one-way communication system used by governments and by corporations to transmit messages to listeners separated by vast geographical distances. Nonetheless, Breck's positive suggestion for a many-to-many -many communication system seems to have come to fruition with the internet and more recently with the spread of social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and of course, Zoom, which we're, we're now on. Today, socialists around the world are using these platforms to produce, distribute, exhibit, and consume socialist media and cultural works far and wide. And they're openly building events, movements, and organizations within digital capitalism to go beyond it. So my Socialist Register 21 essay tries to assess what the internet and social media platforms both give to and take away from 21st century socialist communicators, especially as compared to the 20th century's mass media and cultural industries, which is I'm sure that we, we recognize tended to censor out or simply vilify socialists and their politics. So taking it as axiomatic that communications underpins any possibility for socialist organization and politics today, my essay contextualizes the brave new world of digital capitalism, historicizes socialist communications from the old media of Marx's time in the 19th century, all the way through to the 20th century TV and radio industries, up into the new media era of our time in the early 20th, 21st, and then maps another emerging world of socialists on social media platforms with an eye to the novelties, the positive possibilities, and the negative problems they bring. So I'll briefly sum up some of the more positive assessments that I've made of the internet and social media for socialists today. So in the 20th century, the age of the mass media and cultural industries, abundant, widespread, and incredibly fast-moving socialist media was very hard to find. One might pick up a book at a library or a store, or buy an organization's newspaper from a comrade on the street, or be handed a magazine or a sort of article from a professor. Um, of the new left or of subsequent generations. But one could not in that era turn on the TV or go to the movies and easily find socialists on, communicating en masse far and wide. Nowadays though, socialist media content is widely available to almost anyone using the internet. On Facebook, you know, hundreds of thousands of socialists are openly building events, movements and organizations within digital capitalism to go beyond it. On YouTube, we have hundreds of socialist channels being watched by hundreds, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously. On live gaming streaming platforms such as Discord and Twitch, socialists from all over the world meet in real time to hash out socialist politics. On TikTok, socialists post funny political pitches. On Instagram and Twitter, socialist memes abound and flourish. So on these and other platforms, socialists are engaging in the battle of ideas. Um, and I don't think that we've seen perhaps um, for the last hundred years such a flourish of socialist content spreading around the world through so many available channels and mediums of communication with such great quantity and intensity. So on platforms, socialists are challenging the neoliberal common sense of much bourgeois media and its apologists for the status quo. They're also directly engaging and attacking the ideology of far right propagandists in real time with the goal of connecting with people where they're at and there's literally billions of people on social media right now. And of course, with the goal of winning people away from neoliberalism, away from the far right and to a contemporary 21st century socialist politic. Um, on, on these platforms, socialists are also constructing positive socialist identities for themselves, avatars and conveying these to the world. Now representing oneself as a socialist, perhaps with a rose emoji on Twitter, is a way to proudly express one's identity as a socialist and be recognized for it. And I think this is an important symbolic act given the long history of anti-socialist shame campaigns in the mainstream media. On platforms, so self-identified socialists are also searching for, forming and participating in virtual socialist communities. These platforms unbind socialist interaction from the constraints of pro propinquity and are new meeting spaces for socialists spread across cities, regions and countries. Um, this online meeting tonight, of course, has brought together more than 100 people from all across Canada, the United States, and elsewhere together. 
Um, and of course, that's not to say that local place-based face-to-face organizing and activi activism doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But what I'm saying here is that these new platforms and spaces afford us also an additional space to get together, to network, to connect, to deliberate, to discuss, and to mobilize for, um, for the future. On platforms, socialists are also self-educating. So on YouTube, a learner can subscribe to free courses such as Reading Marx's Capital with David Harvey, uh, watch the hundreds of videos of Leo Panitch giving wonderful lectures over the past 20 years, uh, engage with a decade's worth of recorded public lectures on the Socialist Project's left stream channel, read Vivek Chibber's The ABCs of, of Capitalism pamphlet series alongside the video series sponsored by Jacobin's YouTube channel. So uh, of course, flesh and blood educators matter and they always will, we always will. But for the many people that cannot access us, cannot access universities or colleges and urban-based centers or the socialist organizations that tend to be concentrated in urban centers, these platforms are playing a vital role in making connections and making new socialists. Um, so given the mass media industry's history of filtering out and demonizing socialists, I think these <clears throat> are very significant developments. Nonetheless, there are limitations to socialist communications on social media platforms too. So I'll just highlight some negatives then wrap up. So when logged into social media platforms, socialists get used by what Jody Dean long ago conceptualized as communicative capitalism and what Nick Cernicek recently calls platform capitalism. So to use these platforms, we must first consent to their owner's conditions. And when clicking to accept, we become users subject to those corporations terms of service, policies and community guidelines, including the right of these corporations to collect data about everything that we say and do. Socialists may be doing also a form of unpaid digital labor and functioning as exploitable prosumer commodities for these companies, which take in billions in revenue each year. And again, this is my most cheerful essay on social media platforms and internet because the last 10 years has been doing basically a neo-Marxist political economy of all the negatives. But I'm trying to look at some silver lining here. Also, there are political risks in using these platforms because the relationship between platform owners and socialist users is authoritarian, not democratic. Platforms are accountable to their shareholders first, their advertisers second, and their users uh, third. So these companies could deplatform socialists and delete our pages and content at any time. And there's emerging instances of them doing just that with very little to no explanation as to why. Furthermore, platform capitalism's data valence of prosumers is converging with state surveillance of citizens. And so you have this convergence of the big brother of the security state with the little brothers of platform capitalism that are monitoring, aggregating, collecting, and, and putting values, exchange values on our data each and every day. So they put each and every socialist that uses these platforms in the security state surveillance crosshairs. If the socialist left ever one day became a serious challenge to the status quo, the NSA officer would only need to turn to Facebook for a registry of the who's who of the socialist left. So while the internet and social media platforms are enabling socialists to communicate in ways that were not possible in the pre-digital world of mass media, there are major limits and risks. For now though, I argue we should be using these platforms and continuing to build outside of and around them too. In the end, social media platforms are supplements to, not substitutes for, building democratic and sustainable socialist organizations and militant working class movements. And today, as always, and as Leo, of course, would, would remind us, that remains the key socialist challenge on and off and with and through the internet and social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Tanner. I think my uh, challenge is uh, not only that, but also to keep up with you with that mesmerizing list of uh, of, look, uh, of sites and uh, forms of communication that you just mentioned. I, I couldn't, after reading your essay several times, I'm still <laughs> trying to keep up with everything you, you cited in it. I'm yeah. gonna turn now to Derek Renishin, uh, a teacher in the Department of Communication Studies at York, York University. Uh, author of a really fundamental text, uh, The Limits of Digital uh, of the Digital Revolution, a really great book examining some of the themes of this volume. Uh, Derek's essay in this year's uh, uh, volume is titled Imagining Platform Socialism. Derek? Thank you very much, Greg. I'm very honored, actually, and humbled to be part of this event uh, and the historical tradition um, that the Register represents. Um, 
I don't really have a whole lot that I think it would be appropriate for me to say uh, about, about Leo. Um, I, I knew Leo well and miss him terribly. Um, but I wasn't one of those students at York uh, whose dissertation he supervised, nor did I take a class with him. Um, but I was there when he was teaching. And uh, I think what I, what I want to say about that is that it was really clear after a little while that I was in a place uh, that I felt like I belonged, and that was mostly the, uh, in large measure because of things Leo had done to build a kind of community of scholars uh, and, and uh, create an atmosphere that was supportive of all kinds of critical engagement, was welcoming to all kinds of people. Even the ones that were not his students would benefit from this. And I think that uh, Leo always wanted the things that were of value to him to be of value to more than just those who directly interacted with him. But, uh, and uh, I think that's the case with all the work he did uh, through everything outside the institution of the academy as well, which I think we all value and we know we've seen Leo engaging in public debates through the media a, a number of times. And, and I'm always going to remember him for that, as well as the academic lessons that I, I know I learned from him directly, but I, I feel like even if I had never met him uh, personally while I was there at York, uh, that I still would have learned a lot from him and benefited a great deal and been able to learn more because of what he did. Uh, and I think that in, in that sense, the sense of being a public intellectual in, 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 in more than just a sense of reaching it through the media, but um, in public intellectual in the sense of creating a public sphere, uh, an environment in which everybody can benefit. That's uh, something I will always remember about him. Uh, of course, I'm also very happy that he asked me to submit uh, an essay for this volume of the register. Uh, I think um, it's important to me that I'm able to publish in a form like this because I think perhaps my essay is not uh, entirely typical of, of what tends to get uh, in these pages. Um, but I think th there are important things to say about, about the political economy of things like social media and, and my essay actually builds very much on and follows what, what Tanner um, is saying there at the end about the limitations of social media. I, tried to um, suggest reasons why we need to rethink the way social media are. While, of course, I agree with Tanner, we should make use of the potentials that the technologies present to us. Um, but we need to rethink how they work, because how they work is a problem. And I think this has become uh, even more evident than it was when I wrote this last year uh, in the last um, what month and four days. Um, the, the, the events in Washington in January uh, weren't perhaps the most important thing that ever happened, but they were quite frightening to very many people. And I think they speak to uh, the, the problems um, that are embedded in the social media platforms. I, I'm, I'm not trying to make a deterministic argument about the power of the media, but given the way social forces are aligned in the United States these days, the existence of platforms that engage in the algorithmic promotion of a violent and extremist agenda uh, is, is a very serious danger. And, uh, and those events made that even more obvious to many, I think. But at the same time, the response to those events, the way the private monopolistic digital platforms exercised their power by defining the limits around what was acceptable political discourse, deplatforming Donald Trump, um, which happened with the biggest three platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And then almost immediately after when Donald Trump's followers flocked to a new platform called Parler, which was much more open to an unmoderated uh, discussion, then Amazon, Google, and Apple just simply decided to um, deplatform the platform of Parler. And this, uh, this is really, really dangerous too, that five or six individuals basically made the decisions to shut down an entire discussion. It's not a discussion I think that we should have wanted to exist, but nor do I think that such a small number of extremely powerful capitalists um, should have 
opportunity open to them. And this, by the way, is something that even Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, agrees with. He, he went public afterwards and said, we had to do that, and, and I think we shouldn't have the power to do that, but we had to. So this is a big problem. This is not, this is, this is a, a huge difficulty. Um, the, the, the mobilization of that kind of private power um, has been there for all, all, a long time. I mean, the platforms have been, as Tenor noted, accountable to their shareholders and advertisers primarily. And, and that's, that has set the conditions under which everybody, including socialists, have been able to communicate widely amongst each other across the population for a long time. And, and that kind of private power has what actually motivated me to, to write uh, this essay about imagining how things could be different. Now, there are already calls for things to be different that are not calls for platform socialism. The Canadian government is any day now about to release some platform governance uh, bill. The United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union have all announced uh, plans to uh, alter laws around this as well. And in the short term, I think it's actually quite important now, given, given what happened in Washington last month, quite important to support those kinds of reforms uh, to laws so that we can perhaps rein in the worst excesses. But in the long term, I think there's good reasons why whatever they come up with is just simply not going to work. The platforms are too complex, too powerful, uh, too attached to people's sense of freedom of expression to be really effectively regulable. And even if I'm wrong about that, even if there's a an effective way to regulate these big platforms, it would need to involve a deeper kind of regulation than, than liberal democracies generally engage in. Um, and so I, I, I've tried to trace out uh, in, in my essay uh, a suggestion, a possibility that maybe platforms could actually work quite differently. If we could get rid of the, the private commercial platforms, uh, there is a possibility that perhaps something based on an open source uh, model where a set of common protocols could be used pretty much the same way email works these days, where no one company has to be in charge of a whole platform, a whole discussion, uh, where people could be able to take control over the algorithms that distribute the information for themselves. The point is not that there's, uh, there's a, a well worked out technical plan, or that even the suggestions that I make necessarily would work. Um, the point really is that we need to imagine something different because what we are currently required to use if we are going to communicate with everybody else and this is part of the problem with their monopolistic power we we need to use facebook even if we don't like it um, and, and we should use it and we can benefit from using it even though the conditions it provides to us just aren't what we think the conditions should be we need to get away from that um, and we need to create something where individuals and communities can be much more in control of the kinds of decisions that are made over the ways that they communicate. And it might not work. Maybe what I trace out might not, but something needs to work. Uh, something that needs to be a non-capitalist organization of the communicative capacities that we all possess. And not having a plan doesn't mean we shouldn't advocate for one. We should certainly uh, invest our efforts in trying to develop plans that might work. And I actually argue that, that one thing that would be necessary would be public support, not public ownership in the sense of mass media, uh, like a public broadcaster, but public support for an open source project that would be ultimately accountable only to its users, um, but would need support, resources and recognition uh, from some kind of public administrative body. And I think if we, if, if we are capable of doing that, if we do put some efforts into thinking about how we could design the platform that would allow us to communicate what we want to, that it would actually lead to the creation of something that had never been created before, something that's, that's quite new. Um, it would not be centralized state support it would, for all of its resources. It would not be uh, completely open to control by capital. It would have to be something radically new that has never existed yet. And in that sense, I think it's utopian in, in the way that Leo always encouraged us to be utopian, um, but concretely utopian. And as Sam said, not just to daydream, um, but to have these concrete hopes. I think they're essential in, in any project of transforming the world. 
Um, so I, you know, don't think this is this essay is the last word on the subject, but I hope that there will be more work done to try to trace out these other kinds of utopian ideas of how communication might be in the end much more democratic and might serve all of us rather than just serving uh, the owners and the controllers of digital capitalism. So thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Um, just to uh, start drawing things together, uh, Leo and I were uh, uh, both so pleased that everybody in this volume uh, took exactly the approach of Tanner and David and uh, the other, uh, Derek, sorry, Tanner and Derek and the other presenters uh, this, this evening uh, and showing the limits of a digital capitalism that's entrapped in value production and the ways that we could think of new ways of living if not confined within these limits. Uh, a range of the other essays take this on in terms of, of public transit, uh, healthcare, uh, uh, Jesus, it's just, just such a number of things, fashion, uh, is another area, cinema is another area. So there's a whole range of essays that are exploring uh, exactly these themes. Um, we are putting on a, a series of, of, of uh, discussions on each of the essays in the so this year's Socialist Register with a Marxist educational project out of New York. Uh, you can uh, zoom in on it. Uh, uh, they're basically weekly. Uh, this Sunday, there's a terrific talk by Larry Lohman on his, in his stunning essay on, on uh, artificial intelligence as the new interpretation machines and the contradictions of living in a world organized by algorithms on Sunday. Uh, I want to end uh, uh, this uh, part of the, uh, the discussion with returning to the preface of, of this year's volume and what Leo and I wrote in the late summer, early fall, late summer of this year, um, or last year. In addressing how far digital technology has become integral to the capitalist market dystopia of the first decades of the 21st century, we were deliberately seeking to counter so much facile, futurist, cyber utopian thinking that has proliferated through these decades. The proof of capitalism's continued dynamism, even in the face of severe global economic crisis, lay in the most successful and most celebrated high-tech corporations of the new information sector, which really, were which really were restructuring and refashioning not only our ways of communicating, but of working and consuming indeed ways of living. Yet precisely because this was taking place within the logics of capitalist accumulation and exploitation and through the reproduction of capitalist social relations, this produced new contradictions and irrationalities. Perhaps none of these was, was greater than those revealed by the contrast between the investment planning and preparation that went into the interminable competitive race for more speed by way of reducing latency and digital communications by so ma many milliseconds on the one hand, and on the other hand, the lack of investment planning and preparation that underlay the scandalous slowness of the, response, of the responses to the spreading COVID-19 pan, COVID pandemic around the world. Leo and I were planning uh, to pick up exactly this theme in the preface for the next volume of the register. And we had kind of been, we planned and uh, had commissioned all the essays for it more or less by the early fall and had begun just thinking through what we were gonna uh, uh, try to push each author to, author to do when Leo went into the hospital. Uh, this volume, uh, we've tentatively titled New, New Polarizations, Old Contradictions, The Crisis of Centrism. It is crushing uh, for me, but I think for all of us, uh, not to be working on this volume with Leo. It's just unbelievable. I've been lucky that Colin Lees will pick up uh, a, 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 and co-edit with me this year, uh, a, a strike of miraculous fortune in a way after such terrible, terrible tragedy. I'm so glad that Colin has decided to help out. Um, I want to also thank uh, uh, for the production of this year's volume, uh, Louis Proyek for the incredible cover he's done for the, for the, for the volume. Uh, also, uh, Adrian Howe and Tony Zurbrick for Merlin Press for their support, uh, Month of Review Press and Fernwood Books for their respective uh, distribution and publication of the register in the US and Canada. Uh, 
besides a launch, this is also a memorial uh, uh, to Leo's contribution to the Socialist Register and the Socialist Movement, uh, our friend and comrade. I want to turn over uh, uh, the hosting now back to Steve Mayer uh, to uh, introduce the last component of today's meeting, uh, another clip from Leo. Thanks, Greg, and thanks um, everyone for those wonderful presentations and, and thoughtful comments. Um, like everybody, I think, you know, being at a register launch, I, I, I personally, I miss Leo every single day and, and today I miss him more than ever. Um, so this is actually really, really hard. Um, so now we're gonna play one last video clip, um, which is from Leo's wonderful 2009 uh, Phyllis Clark lecture uh, called Still a Marxist After All. Um, when I was choosing these clips, Tanner advised me to choose those that would come through most clearly on the Zoom format. Uh, and although mm -hmm. this one was recorded a while back and is not of the highest video and audio quality, I hope you'll all agree that it's an excellent way for us to bring him back to close our meeting today and to say goodbye. Marx would tell you that without the development of popular class forces through radical new movements and parties, this kind of really radical proposal for the socialization of finance must fall on infertile ground. Notably, during the economic crisis of the 1970s, radical forces inside many of European, Europe's social democratic and labor parties put forward similar proposals. But they were unable to get their leaders, the leaders of those parties, to go along with such reforms. Those leaders derided these proposals as old-fashioned. Attempts to talk seriously about the need to democratize our economies in such radical ways were largely shunted to the side, not only by neoliberals, but also by social democrats and postmodernists for the next two or three decades. We are still paying for the marginalization of such ideas. The irrationality built into the basic logic of capitalist markets, so deftly analyzed by Marx, is once again evident. Sauf qui peut, each firm lays off workers and tries to pay less to those kept on. Undermining job security has the effect of undercutting demand throughout the economy. As Marx knew, micro-rational behavior has the worst macro-rational outcome. We can now see where ignoring Marx while trusting in Adam Smith's hidden hand gets you. The crisis today also exposes irrationalities in realms well beyond finance. One example is the widespread call for trading in carbon credits as a solution to the climate crisis. The supposedly progressive proposal whereby corporations that meet emission standards sell credits to others that don't meet their own targets is problematic because it depends on volatile derivative markets that are inherently open to manipulation and to credit crashes. Marx would insist that to find solutions to the global problems of climate change, we need to break with the logic of capitalist markets rather than use state institutions to reinforce them, as the carbon credit proposal seeks to do. He would call for the nationalization of the auto industry and all its component supplier parts, and its planned conversion into an industry that not only produces cars that run on hydrogen or electricity, as well as mass transit vehicles, but also engages in the planned conversion of that industry so that it produces solar panels. Of course, Marx would also call for international economic solidarity rather than economic competition among states in this process. As he put it in the manifesto, united action of the leading countries at least is the first condition for the emancipation of the proletariat. Yet the work of building new institutions and movements for change must begin at home. Though he called for workers of the world to unite, Marx still insisted that the workers in each country first of all settle things with their own bourgeoisie. The measures required to transform existing economic, political, and legal institutions would of course, as he put it, be different for different countries. But in every case, Marx would insist that the way to bring about radical change was first to get people in each country to think ambitiously again. How is that likely to happen? Even at a moment 
when the financial crisis that began in the U.S. has led to a general economic crisis that is bleeding dry a vast swathe of the world's people, the future prognosis is uncertain. If you were alive today, Marx perhaps would not look to pinpoint exactly when or how the current crisis would end, but rather would point out that such crises are part and parcel of capitalism's continued dynamic existence. Reformist politicians who think that they can do away with the inherent class inequalities and recurrent crises of capitalist society are the real romantics of our day themselves clinging, clinging to a naive utopian vision of what the world might be like without the fundamental changes in social relations and the full democratization of economic as well as political life that Marx saw as necessary to transform capitalism. If the current crisis has demonstrated one thing, it is that Marx was the greater realist. That is why he insisted on the need for a much more ambitious vision and agenda for the type of change you really need, if you can believe in it. This must involve the kind of political activism that works hard at developing both the institutional and popular capacities to make real change possible. And to this end, was Marx's vision of socialism all about? As he put it, when as a young man he was engaged in turning Hegel on his head, Socialism is not a state of affairs which is to be established, not an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself, but the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. Like every revolutionary, Marx wanted to see the revolution in his lifetime, but capitalism had plenty of life in it. And he could only glimpse, however perceptively, at the mistakes, let alone the wrong terms, that socialist movements, both those that eventually made revolutions and those which didn't, would commit. The point of still being a Marxist today lies in taking seriously what Marx meant when he wrote in the 18th Brumaire that the goal has to be to recover the spirit of the revolution, as he, as he put it, not merely to set its ghost walking about again. The point is not to return to Marx in order to convince ourselves again that history is on our side and that capitalism, this time, has really reached its expiry date. Still less to think that the old parties of the working class can be revived as viable agents of change. And even less still to look to the ex-communist leaders of Russia, Eastern Europe, and China to admit their folly in opting for global capitalism. Nor is it to imagine that the proletariat, as Marx knew it, is now finally going to be forced by this crisis to rediscover its revolutionary vocation. This firmly established the dictatorship of the proletariat and smashed the state. None of this way of thinking is very helpful. What is helpful is to realize that the opportunity is there for people to organize, still using a class map, even if not the same one that Marx used to build new institutions through which they can develop the capacities to determine better their collective needs and to democratize the state and the economy. We do need to relearn from Marx that movements for protest are not enough and that societies can't really be changed without contesting for state power since this is where class power is concentrated and reproduced. And while we may gain insight and courage from reading his essay on the Paris Commune, we also need to go beyond his concept of a state in transition to figure out how to avoid co-optation on the one hand or socialist dictatorship on the other. To finally put in process a means whereby state power is actually about using the resources of the state to empower and develop, develop the self-governing capacities of people. Does still being a Marxist mean that one is sure this is going to be realized? Not at all. I would even say the odds are against it. Even though I am pretty sure that we are going to see plenty of renewed class struggles, the building of new socialist movements, and the rekindling of revolutionary ambitions in the 21st century. But we can only impoverish our own spirit if we stand aside and try to contribute to it.
whatever the are. Thank you. Perfect.